Hello everyone. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Yes, you are. Yes, sir. Thank you. Thank you. So, hello. I'm Tanmay, your host for the day from Udan Aviation Academy, and I totally hope that you all are doing good. Uh, uh, before we begin, like many of you already know us. but for those who don't udan aviation academy uh, i'm going to introduce it to all of you so udan aviation academy is a fast growing aviation learning platform so we have come up with a range of initiatives including online trainings workshops blogs and a lot more but one of the most important initiatives here at udan is aviation webinars and that's exactly why we have gathered here so it's been a long time since we have been requested to cover the world of air cargo and it's just that we have been waiting for the right time and the right expert so for today we are uh, we uh, i must say we have got the right expert with us so we are glad to welcome the expert and the speaker for the day mr mukesh mudholkar sir welcome sir so the under his belt mr mukesh has got an extensive 30 years of experience in the field of air cargo as well as it which actually fits the uh, uh, it's actually in line with the topic for the day which as all of you know it is unlock technology connecting air cargo stakeholders so mr mukesh has been part of many well known companies in and outside of the air cargo sector and this list prominently includes unisys global service Vipro IT Cargo, KL Consultancy, and some big aviation brands like UPS, Air France, Swiss Air, Singapore Airlines, and our national carrier Air India. So whether it be basic air cargo operations or the weight and balance for mighty aircraft in the likes of let's say seven four seven, so Mukesh sir has done it all and been there, done that. Uh, but his professional life has left no stone unturned. He has started. as uh, from positions as smaller as customer service or baggage handling and a lot more so i'm sure you all, you all are well excited to hear straight from the speaker but allow me to make a couple of quick announcements here that uh, through the course of this webinar your microphones are put on mute to avoid any unplanned noise getting into the session however we you can always put forward your query to the host in the chat box itself uh, Uh, also there is a dedicated question and answer session for all of us as the presentation concludes so it would make a really great opportunity for all of us to get our long kept questions answered directly from the expert himself uh, now i think without further ado i won't speak much so i would request mr mukesh to begin with his presentation uh, over to you mukesh sir all the best thank you welcome everyone i hope all of you can hear me loud and clear it is perfect sir yeah fantastic fantastic so um and thanks for the good introduction that you have done so far uh, the journey is still young i would say one keeps on learning and i would encourage everyone over here to look at the basics of air cargo first and slowly push their way up as they go along so as we see today we hear a lot of words right one of the words that we always have been hearing for a long time has been lockdown and lockdown continued for a long time lockdown 1 lockdown 2 lockdown 3 and now of course we have come to this phase of unlock and that exactly what we want to do we want to unlock a lot of things that would make the business grow now what is that business that we talking about i'm sure you must have heard about air cargo air cargo has been one of those other points in this entire last 3 4 months which has been the focal point on everyone's uh, words or years or vows or whatever you want to say it's been there in the news it's been there on television so air cargo is the fundamental of today's business and uh, there's so much of focus on air cargo it is becoming very important that cargo and technology bind together to ensure that the end customer the end customers is you and me we are the end customers finally and of course there are a lot of other stakeholders who along 
in the supply chain ensure that we are also connected so there is a need for us we are the retailers or the consumers and of course there is a manufacturer and the shipper so in the whole process we have got multiple players and each one of them has got a role to play the industry itself is is extensive it's challenging and uh, as we go along in your careers you will also see that you know there are a lot of nuances that are there in this industry which are very challenging and some of those challenges is something that we have seen now and as we go ahead we will figure out that these challenges can definitely become uh, turning points in the transformation of the air cargo industry so i've been talking a lot of the terms cargo and technology but what exactly is cargo so as we go along it's very important for us to understand cargo and air cargo now anything that moves from point a to point b is cargo but anything that is moving by air is air cargo and as the name itself suggests air cargo means something that goes on an aircraft and i'm sure everyone must have seen those big packages that are going on an aircraft but however there is a small uh, twist to the whole thing not everything is air cargo the baggage which goes on the aircraft definitely doesn't come as cargo okay where you check in your baggage as a part of your passenger ticket that is not cargo but baggage which goes in which is not accompanied by the passenger is called as cargo okay besides that anything which is shipped by a shipper or a consigner and to be transported from point a to point b is cargo so i hope this definition is clear we got to understand very clearly what is cargo the few of the concepts have changed in the coming days where everything that was called as cargo was limited only to uh, the, the packages that are going through mail was not included which i've said over here mail was considered as mail as a separate entity but however there have been some changes where mail also is included as part of cargo but like i said these things keep on changing so to get a perspective about the industry okay, it's a 6.8 trillion dollar industry you see the value it's a 6.8 trillion dollar value in value which is just 35% of the world trade however in terms of volume it is just 1% right so 35% in value 1% in volume so which means that a very small consignment moves by air okay. and of course this is going to change in the coming years the industry has grown at the rate of around 3 to 4% but as things evolve this industry is going to grow at a much faster pace so even with 1% trade in volume we have got 7.4 7.4 billion parcels sent every year about 52 million metric tons of goods transported every year and about 2.5 million lives are saved by vaccines every year now again these numbers are just a tip of the iceberg especially when it comes to 2.5 million lives saved by vaccines so you know that currently the requirement of vaccines is for 8 billion people 8 billion people across the globe and what iata has said that it will require 8000 747 aircrafts to transport and deliver this vaccines to every point across the globe okay so we're talking about 8 billion people 8747 aircrafts and i would say that we have just got about 8 weeks 
plus and minus is when these vaccines will be ready to be shipped out and the industry has to be ready. Now, these facts are coming from IATA. So the source is from IATA, so acknowledge IATA for that. Right. So you can understand the value air cargo has, especially in this pandemic situation. And the challenges that the industry is going to see is going to be tremendous, especially when you have to manage a cold chain. The temperature of the vaccines ranges from two to eight degrees. We still don't know what temperature will be required, but if it requires two to eight degrees, then the entire supply chain has to be well coordinated. And that's the reason why it becomes easy or it becomes important to understand who the stakeholders of the industry are and how do they play a role in each of these activities. But before that, let me give you a perspective of how the business evolved over a period of time. Okay. Because if we know the past, only then you will be able to think about the present and figure out what is it that was done differently in the past and what is it that can be done differently as we go ahead. Right. So, as the passenger aircrafts were being used to transport passengers, definitely, cargo was just a filler. So, there was some empty space in the underbelly of the aircraft. So, it was said, hey, let's put in some cargo. And you won't believe the first transportation that took place was for mail shipments. And the first commercial air cargo airline was only after the World War II, that is post-1945. But with all this, the contribution to the airline in terms of revenue was just about 4%. Now this revenue is increasing for airlines. Some of the airlines has got something like 8%, going up to 14%. And those who operate with freighters, now freighters are those aircrafts which carry only cargo, there the contribution is close to about 20%. But all these dynamics will change. Then came a person named Fred Smith who changed the complete face of the industry by getting in Federal Express. Initially, Federal Express started off only as parcel providers. But currently, they not only deliver parcels, documents, but they deliver hard freight as well. So it would be good for each one of you to study the history of Fed, Federal Express, study the pricing model of Federal Express, and study the pricing model of traditional air cargo providers. That would give you a sense of how business has evolved over a period of time and how FedEx changed the dynamics of the entire business. So just to give you a perspective again, <clears throat> in the past, whenever you had to move a shipment, all the rates and charges were calculated manually. So just to give an example of where I came in from, I came in from Air India, I started my career in Air India, and we were doing the calculation of rates using manuals. So if you have a shipment going from point A to point B, you had to we had the information about the shipment in terms of the pieces and weight, and based on which we had to do the calculation looking at every rule in the book to ensure that the right price is being given to the shipment. And of course, once the calculation of the rates were being done, we had to capture that manually on an air paper. Okay. An air paper is a document that's used for transportation of goods from point A to point B. It's a contract of carriage. Right. So, <coughs> excuse me. So, with the bookings being done, and these bookings were done using a phone line. We used to call up the airline, and then at that time, we had no call centers. So the bookings were being logged on with the airline personnel itself, and the records were being maintained in ledgers or registers. While while computerization, I would say, or automation came in, but that was very slow. 
So all the data was initially captured in registers and then it was captured into an automated system or a computer. Even the flight documents were created manually. Some of you who have been in the industry for some time, you will know that airwayable, the house airwayable, the manifest, all those documents currently are generated by a software or a computer. But at that time, we had a typewriter. A typewriter was being used to type out the airwayables, was used to type out the flight manifest. And all those documents were exchanged between different stakeholders in its physical form. So you see, I mean, how things have evolved from what it was in the past to what it is now. So what did technology do? The technology actually changed the way the business was getting done. It is evolutionary. That means it needs that it has evolved over a period of time. It has not changed dramatically in quick time. It has evolved over a period of time. Changes have been very gradual. Unfortunately, I would think that it should have been revolutionary, but of course, it has not been that way. The passenger business is far ahead of us, but cargo has been lagging behind, not for anything else, but I think the willingness has to be there in each of the stakeholders to ensure that we move ahead in a much faster pace. I'll come to that as we go along. So the businesses over a period of time has been gradually improving, not from not from from a from a revenue perspective. Yes, revenue perspective it has been evolving, but in terms of the capability of the industry to deliver the requirements of the end customer, that has been enhanced. The performance of the industry also has been better ever since there has been technology that has been used to enable the business. In the past, whenever there were some things that were being done, especially like, for example, if a shipper has tendered his cargo to an uh, airline and uh, he said, hey, the shipment has to move from point A to point B. And after that, he was at the airline's mercy and he didn't know anything about the shipment until such time it was delivered to the consignee and the consignee would call him up and say, you know what, hey, I've received the shipment. So the track and trace of the consignee, which earlier was not known to the any of the stakeholders, that became possible with the use of technology. So that's the reason why I've been saying the pace has been slow. While technology got adopted, However, the pace at which it got adopted was very slow. It didn't change the business dynamics totally. It evolved over a period of time. So as business kept on growing, there were smarter and inexpensive ways of getting business was being explored. But like I said, you know, there was this consideration that, hey, the revenue that we get from Kafu is just about, you know, 4%, 5%, and doesn't really bring too much of value to us. So it was part of a way to be done later. So any budgets that were been approved by the airlines were especially towards the enhancement of the passenger side of the business, and less importance was given to the cargo side of business. But everybody knew that, yes, if there's something that can be improved, it is only through technology. Now, technology becomes one part of the story. But then, technology is purely, I'll come to that part of it later, but technology is purely doing something which you were doing earlier manually. However, if you digitize whatever has been done manually currently, it will have a tremendous impact on the way business is being done. Few of the things that could happen, and I'm sure again, if some of you have been in the business, you would know that the, most of the time, the cargo that you receive from the shippers is lying in the warehouse, and when it lies in the warehouse, it is prone to damage, it is 
from the pilferage. And of course, the warehouse is not supposed to be a storage area. The warehouse is supposed to be a transit area from where cargo should just come in and move out. However, it doesn't happen. The reason why it doesn't happen is because there are a lot of formalities that need to be completed and they have been done manually or physically, which takes a longer period of time. So the dwell time at the airport gets longer. The aim of digitization is to ensure that this process is much, much faster. Right? So again, if you have been in the industry, even if you are there uh, at the initial stages of your careers, if you have been with uh, the airport, associated to the airport handling cargo, you would know that there are different types of cargo. One is the destination cargo, one is the transfer cargo, one is the transit cargo. Each of this cargo has different procedures that need to be followed. So your transfers, if they are done over paper, I'm sure people must have heard about terms like a CTM, cargo transfer manifest. So that would require permission from the customs. It has to be given out to the ship, to the to the other airline, get a signature. But what will happen if it all digitizes? That means the approvals are in place before the cargo arrives at the transfer transfer station or transit station, and it moves out. With digitization, or what will also happen is that you will be able to track your cargo in real time. You will know exactly at every place of transfer, transits, or even your acceptance and delivery, you will know exactly where the shipment lies. With this, what would happen is that your capacity at the warehouse will be enhanced. You will not have cargo stored for a long period of time. which would also mean is that you would be able to utilize the capacity of the aircraft in a much better way. How is that correlated? Very simple. If you have planned something for a flight and for some reasons, because of approvals, the shipment is not going to go on a particular flight, the capacity on the flight is underutilized. And once the aircraft takes off, whatever capacity is gone, unutilized, is a waste of revenue. And as this, we know that the revenue that you get from cargo is just about 4%. It becomes very difficult to have an underload of an aircraft when cargo was lying in your warehouses. Right? I hope you get a sense of what I'm saying. If you have any questions, of course, we could take them later. But please do understand that technology plays a very key role in the way business has been done. And it is us, for us to ensure that we use the technology in the right manner. Now, when we say us, who are the us? Okay. So let's understand a few of the players in the cargo value chain. It starts with the shipper ends with the consignment. Unless we have goods moving from point A to point B, and we have a shipper and a consign consignee, I'm sorry, Ship, unless we have a shipper and a consignee, transportation of goods does not take place. Right. So if you look at the diagram itself, you will figure out that uh, there is a truck operator involved, there's a freight forwarder involved, at the both the ends of the value chain, that is at exports as well as at imports. Okay. There is a customs agent, there is a regulator. Custom agent could be your customs uh, personnel who would give clearances for a shipment. And when you say a regulator, a regulator would also mean customs, but there would be other regulatory approvals that need to be taken, especially for shipments of, say, pharmaceuticals or live animals or anything which is of a precious nature that requires prior clearances. Right. Then you will have your ground handling agents. Okay. Ground handling agents are the people who would ensure that the shipment is 
taken over from the agent or the shipper to be transported on the aircraft. You have a GSA or a general sales agent who's responsible for the sale that is done in a particular geographical area. And all the stakeholders, as I said earlier, are there on both the sides of the process, that is the export process as well as the import process. Now, each one of them has a specific action or a specific responsibility towards the smooth transportation of goods. Okay, so who, what is it that they do? The shipper and the consignee, they get into a contract or they would have a agent who will be involved in the process. But the agent normally comes in only when you have to transport the goods. But the deal between moving the cargo from point B to point B is between the shipper and the consignee. They decide which airline, which agent would be involved in the process and they appoint a freight forwarder or an IATA agent. They have been called many names. You have the name of a freight forwarder whose name itself suggests that he is the one forwarding the cargo. Then you have an IATA agent who's nothing but a freight forwarder who's approved by IATA. You will also have a clearing agent. A clearing agent is somebody who's got a know-how of all the custom rules and regulations and he will ensure that he takes care of the clearances from the customs. So freight forwarder, IATA agent, clearing agent, they could be three different entities or they could be one entity. Ideally, a freight forwarder and IATA agent are the same, but a freight forwarder may also be a non-IATA agent. Now, of course, you would ask me who's IATA. I mean, I'm sure you may be knowing that IATA is the governing body who is responsible to ensure that they put the policies and practices in place for smooth transportation of commercial air cargo and, of course, passenger planes. Right? I presume that uh, I'm going at a good pace so that there is a clear understanding of the concepts. All right. <clears throat> so then comes the carrier. The carrier is the one who transports the goods. Now again, there are different types of carriers, but let's look at a traditional carrier. A traditional carrier is the carrier which only moves shipments from point A to point B. <coughs> Excuse me. That is airport of origin to airport of destination. So they are point to point operators. When you look at an integrator, an integrator is somebody like a Federal Express or a UPS. They are integrators. What it means is that they actually do the business of the freight forwarder at both the ends. That means they engage with the shipper. They engage with the consignee, they do the custom clearances, they do the transportation, they do the warehousing and ensure that the delivery of the shipment is done at the warehouse of the consignee once it is picked up from the shipper's warehouse. And I said there's a ground handler. A ground handler is the one who has the responsibility of ensuring that the shipment that has been handed over by the forwarder or by the uh, shipper has been accepted in a condition where it is ready for carriage. That means it has been securely checked, the packing is good, all the formalities in respect to, especially with respect to special cargo like a dangerous food, it has got the proper packaging, and only then will the shipment be accepted. I will not get into details of each of the activities of the ground handler because there will be so many of them and it will be difficult for me to cover everything in this particular seminar. And of course, the customs, they are the people who would, or they are the authority who would give the clearances for the consignments. A broker, also called as a custom agent, is the one who is uh, who, who's the uh, mediator between the, the customs as well as the shippers and the consignee at both the ends and he gets the goods cleared after paying up of all duties or even 
having tendered the necessary documents required by the transportation officers. And finally, the consignment. So, this is in form of a picture which gives you all the stakeholders. And if you would notice that at every stage, there are documents required. And if you notice, I'm sure you can see this. There's a consigner, which is the shipper, and he has got a whole set of documents, invoice, the parking list, the certificate of origin, dangerous good declaration. Then you have the freight forwarder. The freight forwarder will be executing the available, the house available, the export declaration document, the custom release document for export, and the security declaration. Ground handling agent or the carrier, you prepare the flight manifest, have the export declaration document, import document, declaration document. Similarly, for the import part of it, again, you will have the declaration document, the custom release form. The whole purpose of putting up this particular slide is to give you an indication that there's a lot of document executive exchange between the different parties across the value chain. And at some point of time, or uh, there's a definitely an overlap between the documents required by every party. So imagine all these documents being handed over, transmitted, or rather uplifted along with the flight in terms of uh, uh, pouches being created, they move along with the goods to various stations, and of course there's this fear of a document loss. But yes, these documents go from different hands for different purposes and many of them are still in its physical form. <coughs> Excuse me. So let's just look at some of these things in a little bit more elaborate manner. Okay. So the shipper will create a set of documents, invoice, packing list, certificate of origin and he gives it to the freight forwarder. Freight forwarder will have all these documents and he will use it along with the master available and the house available to see custom function. So set of documents, you add on a few more documents, you go to customs. You say customs, please give me permission to move this. Customs will go through all these documents check for the legality of forwarding a particular consignment and say, okay, okay to move. Only when the custom says you can ship this cargo, it will inform the freight forwarder, yes, now you can hand over the cargo to the airline. Now, once the freight forwarder takes the shipment to the airline, initially he has to do a security. So when a security has been done, some shipments cannot be passing through an X-ray machine. So again, the freight forwarder will have to give him documentation which will satisfy the security personnel that this shipment can, is ready for transportation and does not contain anything which will affect the safety of the aircraft. And then of course, when it goes to the airline, a whole pouch has been created of the manifest, the master available, the house available, okay. And then, of course, the shipper would send all the documents required by the consignee in a separate pouch to the consignee via a third means of transport or, uh, or a second means of transport, as the case may be. So, you see, there are a lot of players. Most of them rely on the same set of documents, and all of them are physical documents. Of course, things are evolving again. I'll come to that. So let's look at it from the import side now. Again, from the import side, the airline who brings in the cargo will submit all the documents to customs. Customs will check those documents to see whether they are good to be delivered to the consignee or good to be transported to the next destination. They will give the clearances. Once they give the clearances, the freight forwarder will then advise the airline uh, sorry, advise the uh, consign, consignee that if the shipment has arrived, consignee will come to the terminal, he will pick up those documents, he will pick up a delivery order, and once the delivery order has been picked up, 
the consignment has been picked up by the uh, consent uh, retrieved from the warehouse and delivered to the consignment. So again, a lot of documentation involved. So what if all this is being done on a cloud platform, which is definitely a possibility and some of the airports are implementing a cloud platform for data sharing. So what we're talking about here is different stakeholders having different set of documents. All of them are in a physical state. That needs to be now put up in a single central database where all the stakeholders who are a party to these documents will have access to a common set of uh, what should I say, authenticated documents and that would expedite the entire process of movement. So there would be a control. And of course, when people would say, or there are been challenges being raised to say that, hey, you know, if we have the data stored on a single platform, it is prone to uh, misuse, which is right from that perspective. However, controls have been established to ensure that such documents which are being stored at the common repository have got controls in place so that only the right people can access that data. Right? Is that clear? I hope so. Just give it a second. I hope I'm clear so far. Sorry, uh, what did you say, Tanna? Yes, sir, you Okay, all right. That's good. All right. So let us look at uh, the expectations of each of the stakeholders. In fact, I'm not going to go through all the expectations of all the stakeholders, but I'm going to talk about a little bit a little bit about few of the stakeholders who have specific requirements <clears throat> and if you notice a little bit carefully you would find that each one has got a same set of expectations now if you have a same set of expectation why should you have different means of getting that expectation met why can't those expectations be available in a single platform we just mentioned if you have it on a cloud, then anybody who requires it will have that access and will be able to only access that data which is required by him or her. Right. So let's look at shipper and the consignee. <clears throat> the shipper would expect to know that what are the schedules available for movement of good from point A to point B? Is there capacity available? Which are the airlines who operate to these points? What are the best rates that are available? Okay, what is the transit time? How long will it take for me to move the good from point A to point B? So I can communicate to the consignee to say, hey, you know, this particular consignment will come to you by say 17th of September. And of course, once he has booked that consignment with a particular airline he would, should be able to track and trace the shipment. And of course, for the shipment to be uplifted, all the documentary requirement should be available in one place. Now, it's like, you know, let's take the analogy. Uh, you want to, uh, you go to a bank to open a bank account. The bank personnel will give you a set of documents that are required to be produced so that the account could be opened. Now, that is a checklist that's already in place. Similarly, for every type of consignment, there would be a requirement of the airline, there would be a requirement of the uh, regulatory authorities, the customs, and the transit stations as well. So one needs to comply. Now, just imagine a situation where the documents have been provided, but not all documents have been provided. 
the shipment is bound to get delayed. And if nobody has that information available in a single place, each one will say, you know what, this is what I require. And the next shift comes in, they will say, hey, you know what, it requires some additional documents as well. That doesn't serve the purpose. Right? So the shipper and the consignee have the same set of expectations okay, of capacity, schedules, documentary requirements, rates, transit time, traffic, track and trace. The freight forwarder and the airline. Now, the freight forwarder would want to know that uh, okay, what is the uh, rate that is available with the airlines. Okay. If you were to, if somebody has worked in and with a freight forwarder, uh, you would see that the freight forwarder has a whole file of rate cards available of different airlines. And if there is a query, you would go through those rate cards. Of course, things have changed now with due respect to things that have changed uh, for now. The agent would go through the rate cards and inform the shipper or the consignee about the rates that are available. Or the airlines which fly to a particular destination and what rates are available at to, and, and what is the transit time for each of us. Having said that, it's not only about the rates, it could also be other charges, the terminal charges that are paid. And of course, the freight forwarder would want to know once this tender the shipment, where is it at this particular point of time? Important part also is the terminal facilities. So what are the terminal facilities that are available? The terminal facilities are very important to know because some shipments require Cold storage, they require to be stored in uh, in a secure zone. Uh, cold storage is shipments of uh, your vaccines, one of those. Your secure zones are your valuable cargo or your vulnerable cargo. They need to be stored in a secure zone. So different types of cargo have different requirements. So there is an expectation that each of the stakeholders needs to be, be wary of what are the facilities available, what are the charges payable and what are the uh, transit times available. So again, going from different providers to fetch the same set of information means that you spend more time in getting all this thing done rather than moving cargo swiftly. The purpose behind air cargo is to move the goods swiftly. If that is being hindered by the lack of information or information is scattered all over the place, this time of transportation gets delayed. Now look at this from the context of what we're going to see in the next couple of months. We're going to have vaccines coming out. Once the vaccines are out, they need to be delivered in time-bound manner to different places across the globe. If there is a miss anywhere, there's a delay anywhere, if it's going to multiple airports and it's been held up because of documentary requirements or claims have not been in place, then the vaccine would lose its immunity. So this is not only about vaccines. This is the kind of process that needs to be followed in the regular movement of cargo as well. So that's where your automation comes in. Now, automation by definition means getting something done, which was earlier done by, by humans or by, by a human intervention. So automation merely changes that process from doing it manually to getting it automated. Whereas digitization means that you would use that data which is being used by one entity in its same form and you can view it on your pc or on your laptop or on your mobile phones in the format that you would want to see in the current process or in the current scenario digitization and automation are being talked in the same parlance but that is not right automation is different from digitization so we have to be very clear that are you automating or you are, are you digitizing? 
digitizing your business. Very important. So few of the examples that I would give you to correlate what is the difference between automation and digitization. A printing of an air ripple and a cargo manifest is automation. This you were doing manually. However, if you transfer the data in the electronic form to all the parties in the, in the supply chain, then that is digitization. Right? So you, one needs to understand what exactly are you doing? Are you digitizing or are you automating? Each one has got its benefits. Okay, You can't have digitization without automation. But we can have automation independently. It will not be digitization. So the industry has moved from a stage where things that were been done manually has been automated. And the things that need to be now moving from the automation phase to digitization is currently still a work in progress item, I would say. So I'm not going through each one of these items over here, but I think it should be clear enough for you to understand there is a difference between automation and digitization. I will pause this slide for a couple of seconds for you to have a look at this. And I would take a short break, just a 30 second break. So let's move on. Let's see what is what kind of benefits you would get from digitization. Data between all the stakeholders. Here we're talking about stakeholders and we're talking about technology. So remember, we are here to bind these stakeholders together through the process of automation and digitization. So automation comes first, followed by digitization. So with the data sharing that would be available, it will become highly beneficial to all the stakeholders to access the data at one go from one particular place. That means there's a single source of the. There is no manual rework. Our mistakes are avoided. Delays are reduced. Of course, as I said, autonomy, uh, automation and uh, digitization goes hand in hand. So the process gets automated leading to digitization. And when you have this entire flow done in a concerted manner, your whole business chain, which is stretched over a period of time, get shortened, which means that you're able to move shipments quickly, which means your cash flows increase. And with the data that you gather from this entire process flow, you would be able to understand what are the inefficiencies in your process, and you will find ways to solve them. And the end customer, which is the consignee, will be benefited. He would know what time a shipment is coming in. And if you're talking about just in time service level, that means your manufacturing activities are aware of the time when a particular consignment would reach the manufacturing center so that it could be further processed and re-exported back. So you're able to get to the market quicker. You're able to deliver the consignments quicker. And of course, there's a whole new value that gets added to the entire supply chain. And I would want all of you to think of this from a perspective of the current pandemic and its impact on the economy and the rollout of the vaccines. Think about it from that perspective and you will figure out how important will it become for uh, adapting technology, adapting automation, adapting digitization in the entire process. So as I was saying, while this is very important, only 60% of the business currently is digitized. And each one of you can think of bright ideas that will help to bridge this gap. There's has not been done now, but of course, there's a lot more that could be done as we go forward. To give you one example, 
A certificate of origin is something which is required to be tendered for the uplift of a shipment. Now, this certificate of origin is normally given by the Chamber of Commerce, and there's a whole process to get that certificate. One has to go physically over there, submit all the documentation, you can take its own sweet time to be processed, and you will get a certificate of origin. That has now been digitized. I'll take a different case altogether, I mean, which is not pertaining to air cargo. Those people, those senior citizens who had to go to their bank to, to let the bank know that they are still alive to get the pensions, they are now no longer required to go there. So was that possible earlier? Yes, it was possible earlier. But why was it not been done? Because it was been practiced, followed, and practice and follow, practice and follow. So nobody thought of changing it. But now this particular scenario has taught us that we need to adapt, we need to change. Only when we adapt and we change, will we be able to bridge this gap between what is digitized and what is not. And it's very important, again, from the perspective is that the aviation industry is highly capital intensive. To have a lot of uh, money spent on getting your aircrafts, operating them. Your operation cost also is very high. So if the entire process of digitization is going to reduce your cost, your operational efficiency improves and you will have a better bottom lines. And that will also give you an indication with all the data that you collect is that is your pricing right? Is your costing right? And if something is wrong, you can figure out how you could reduce your cost. The only way to improve your revenue is by reducing cost. Of course, there are other ways, but the key thing is to reduce your cost. And one of the ways of reducing cost definitely is technology. Right? And of course, when you say technology, again, there are different dimensions. I'm coming to some dimensions of technology. Now let's look at application programming interface, which is API. Now we have two different systems and they each talk, they need to talk to each other. And of course, each system has got its own capabilities and it has got its own data security. Right? But I need information from one system to the other. I don't need to build my systems in such a way that all my data is available in one particular system. I need to build up an interface between two systems which can talk to each other without having to compromise on data and security. So data can be exchanged seamlessly. You will have the capabilities of each of the systems in place, which are highly specialized. However, the other system which requires a data will be able to access only that data which is required to be shared. Only when the data is shared, will you be able to enhance your business. And this data, when it is shared, this shared data can be used to figure out how profitable you are. So you get the data from one system, you get the data from multiple system, all that goes to a data warehouse. And from there, you would have some tools in place that would help you find out your profitability across the group, how your agent has been, been doing, how you have been performing against your budgets, and different ways of even finding out whether there are any deficiencies in your operation process. Of course, your claims and damages, if they are many, you could take action at a specific station to see whether there is something that is incorrect over there that needs to be sorted out. So while some of these aspects are evolving, again, it's, I took it to a stage from where we started with the manual process, we came to automation, we came to digitization. And of course, now this, this whole cycle is evolving further into artificial intelligence and machine learning. And each of this 
technologies are going to help the industry scale up in a much better manner. So it is the artificial intelligence is actually taking your experiences and your operational efficiencies or inefficiencies, okay, and things that you would have probably done in a human manner that is now taken care of by artificial intelligence to figure out the best way to address a particular situation. They have fundamentally been used as a medium to do something better than a water machine could have done otherwise. And a machine learning, of course, analyzes each of this data that you get to different models. And here we talk about smart data, we talk about big data. Big data is just getting data. Okay, that's fine. I mean, you have data available. But unless you use that data in a smart manner, this data is of no use. So machine learning is actually used to analyze this data to create or use different data models and protect uh, project how the business could evolve and grow further. I hope this gives you a sense of, you know, how this whole process of the business along with the stakeholders, their requirements, their expectation, the document that has been used for each of the stakeholders, how are they all connected? And unless they are all mapped together through a layer of uh, intelligence, or I would say a layer of uh, a common system that would allow you to look at the data, these stakeholders will work in silos and will have huge inefficiencies in their entire supply chain. So the purpose is to bind all the stakeholders together through a common platform and ensure that the data is shared in a structured manner. Of course, I don't have to tell you about this. These are, these are obvious inferences that you can draw from AI and benefit that you could get from AI and machine learning. Your, your capacities could be utilized to the optimum manner. Like I said, once the aircraft takes off, you don't have, you have lost your, your capacity. That is gone based. Okay. So with AI and machine learning, you can predict the underutilization of your capacity if it's going to happen and take necessary action. You can forecast the demand and supply. Right? Your efficiencies would come in from the ability to manage your, your aircraft movements, manage your truck movement in a manner which would optimize the way these aircrafts or these trucks are being utilized. You spend less time in waiting in the queue, less time of the cargo lying in the warehouse, and more time moving the cargo by air. And this leads to customer delight, definitely. Now, the other important part of a, of a of machine learning and AI is because of its ability to get data from various sources, you are able to adapt to the best practices of the other logistic service providers and have a common platform to share data. I'm sure you would agree that these are, these are definitely steps in the right direction. And the, as we move along, there could be a, some more disruptive technologies, practices that would come into play, which would change the dynamics of the business. Like Fred Smith did for FedEx, I think now is the time for the air cargo business to change its directions for the better. Currently, most of the airlines are now depending more on cargo movement than on passenger movement. Just about an hour back, I was reading an article where a particular airline has been doing so well in terms of uh, their performance, even though the capacity has been reduced, that their revenues has come down by just less than 1%. So even if the capacity is down, their revenue is still down by 1% compared to the same volumes last year. 
their volumes have grown by about 34%. And this I'm talking about an airline which is engaged in e-commerce business. If you were to see the current state of the e-commerce business, your Amazons or your Flipkarts, these require goods. And Amazon, Flipkarts, and the likes of them, Alibaba, they're all doing it. So there is a vast change in the way the business is getting, to, is getting done. That is not the traditional way. And things will keep on evolving. The stakeholders may have to adapt to new changes, new practices. But this is all about changing. So having said this, there is a body called IATA, which is actually trying to connect all the stakeholders. So IATA takes a lot of pride in analyzing what is happening in the industry and helping the industry adapt the best practices to connect all the stakeholders. They conduct workshops, conferences, they have a good view of the solutions technologies available in the market, and they act as a facilitator to understand the industry requirements and to give guidance to what needs to be done in what circumstances. They believe in collaboration, and only when you collaborate will you be able to innovate. So, IATA is a facilitator, but remember, the doers are all the stakeholders of the industry. Unless each stakeholder agrees to change and to digitize, the whole initiative of IATA will fall flat. So some of the things that has been done by IATA, which to, to again, to connect the stakeholders, okay? I'm sure people must have heard about e-freight and e available Intention of e-freight and e available is to take the physical paper out, communicate only through messages. However, there are challenges. So what IATA did is that they gave a facility called e available link, which would help the freight forwarders to communicate to the airlines without a physical paper. They provided a visibility to all the e-freight freight forwarders or the e-freight compliant freight forwarders a window to figure out which stations and which other agents are on the e-freight so that they don't exchange documents. Now, Airwebill is a e airwebill and we say e-freight, it is the only transformation of the available document in an electronic form. But of course, there are other documents involved as well. But this is one step in that direction. Then we have the most important one, which is currently in the stage where it will probably go live very shortly, is the one record. This is the common data sharing model of the shipping, which I spoke about some time back. So, as I said, IATA plays a very important role in bringing all the stakeholders together through its various programs. So e freight is one of them, one record is the other one. Interactive cargo, which tells you that your shipment is lying at which station, it sends out an alert if there's a deviation to the, to the standard process or the standard route that's expected to be followed, which makes the actions, which makes the actions to be taken in a re proactive manner than a reactive manner. Now, all these initiatives, okay, I'll talk about some of some more of them as well. All these initiatives is something which has been proposed by IATA, agreed by the IATA members, agreed by the IATA members, uh, and and their and their uh, governing uh, uh, bodies, which which are also a very important part like TIACA as well. So they are expected to understand these capabilities that are possible in the market because of technology and they have to adapt it. Now, unless the end customer does not adapt it, all these initiatives do not bring value. Smart facility, some other programs of IATA. One is the smart facility. So, Smart facility tells you about what are the facilities available at each airport. 
if you want to understand what I did say in my, in my last 30 minutes or so, is that warehouses, capabilities of warehouses, capabilities of stations, needs to be known to each of the shippers and the consignees and the other stakeholders. If you don't know them, you can't engage in the effective manner. Then you have the air cargo incident data, which tells you about the occurrence of specific events in the supply chain, which disrupted the supply chain. For example, if you have moved some goods, which was not declared as a dangerous good, or which is not defined as a dangerous good, but because of other substances or other goods which are there in the consignment, it caused an incident. This incident gets recorded, and this becomes a data for the future transportation of goods of the similar nature. Now, this information is available, but if it's available in one particular corner of the world, nobody has got the access to that. So what I did is that I said, hey, this data is available. You can access the data, improve your programs, improve your operational efficiencies, improve your practices that you have in place. Then you have the Cargo Connect program, very simply connecting all the stakeholders, the cargo community systems, especially with each other so that business moves in a smooth way. And there's a message improvement program. Now, as I said, automation, digitization is not possible unless you have the right set of messages and they are being transmitted without any errors. And AITA is doing everything to ensure that these initiatives or these programs improve the penetration level of the messages. When I say penetration level of the messages means they go seamlessly across. They have been used by different stakeholders across the supply chain, and it has been consumed by the respective system without any kind of detections, without duplications, and the error in the message itself is to the minimum. Whatever I see on my screen should be the same data that should be seen in the recipient screen as well. So earlier there was something called as type B messages or car messages. Cargo interchange message protocols is what the messages were there earlier. Those messages, though they are in place now as well, the support of these messages or the enhanced these messages have been stopped effective 2014. And now XML standards are being used to transmit the same set of messages to different stakeholders. Like I said, the current messages still continue to exist, but the usage Though it is there, the enhancement of this has been stopped. So you have an auto check of the XML message to ensure that the format of the XML is the right format as has been standardized by IATA and it can be consumed by any system to exchange these messages. And having said this, there's always been a statement being made is that you know, I have done my part, but you know, somebody else has not done his part. But there's something which I've heard very recently is the customs has taken the initiative to ensure that the assessment of the goods, the registration of goods by importers, the automatic clearances of people of entry, and the other document required by customs is all digitized. And of course, this is currently being done at the port level. And very soon, I'm sure this will come to the end of the day. Right. So the point that I'm trying to make over here is that each of the stakeholders, you remember customs was one of the stakeholders, they have taken some initiatives. Now, unless these initiatives have, have been taken by the stakeholders, other stakeholders as well, the entire process of digitization would not yield enough results. There's a 40% gap that needs to be covered. I'm sure in this particular pandemic, each of the stakeholders would rise to the occasion and ensure that their processes, which are earlier manual or automated, they should be digitized. With that, I hand it over to Subhashish. 
thank you uh, mukesh sir for that uh, wonderful insight session into the world of cargo and how digitization is going to be the disruptor in the air cargo industry i mean couple of highlights which i would like to pick from your session um is a right from the history of air cargo to how we have proceeded or how we are proceeding in the present which uh, with digitization and automation and how artificial intelligence and machine learning are going to sort of uh, change the entire scenario of air cargo business and uh, in that obviously what iata uh, holds um basically i see iata as a string which holds all the beads or all the stakeholders together so the importance of iata is obviously you know quite important out here and i'm sure uh, like me as well you 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 guys have loved this session and you have got a lot of curiosity in you um you have got a lot of your questions so i will request everyone to use our chat boxes to put down your questions to the host and people who have joined us on youtube i would also tell them to sort of use the youtube chat options and put down your questions and as mentioned in this code curiosity is the engine of achievement i would you know uh, you know request everyone to express their questions and express their curiosity and make a good use of this q and a session so 5 minutes i request all the participants to put down their questions go ahead guys right while in the meantime you are putting down your questions of curiosity for our host mukesh sir let me walk you through what we are currently doing in udan aviation academy now at udan aviation academy the ethos is to bridge the gap between industry and academia through our specialized online training modules okay drone is the next big thing in the aviation industry i mean a right from cinematography to aerial mapping to surveillance drones are there everywhere now okay now keeping this same ethos in mind we are introducing fundamentals of drone operation which is a dedicated 3 day module taught by industry experts okay so each and every day you will be having a dedicated industry experts who will be talking about the different uh, you know aspects of drones so on day 1 uh, it will be talking about what are the different types of drone fixed wing rotating wing and also what are the different applications of drone okay um uh, how privacy is a major question when you fly drone so all those sort of um you know things will be addressed on day 1 now day 2 is all about laws okay uh, i mean whenever you are flying drone you need to be in those right government uh, frame and rules and regulations in order to fly your drone so on day 2 we will be particularly focusing on you know what are the different laws which are associated with drones in india what ministry of civil aviation um, you know has formulated in terms of their drone rules and regulation now day 3 is particularly for um, the, the technical aspect of the drone industry okay so we are going to teach different softwares okay so right from uh, you know autopilot software to mapping software to surveying software and as a part of our uh, sort of uh, curriculum we will also provide you those softwares and trial resources so that you can try those out in your free time as to how to use those softwares so a lot of it to offer for you guys very practically oriented session and something which you all can make use of and particularly for the participants who are currently attending this webinar there is a 50% off on the course fees as well and for the first 15 obviously there is an additional discount of 500 rupees as you can see out here okay the link um, to uh, sort of registering for this fundamentals of drone operation module is available in the chat box so all the participants can go in the chat box and fill those forms and our representatives will be in touch with you okay so uh, moving on if we can uh, sort of uh, go on to the q and a session okay so there are a lot of questions uh, which are coming in out over here um 
Yes, I think we'll have uh, those questions coming in. Uh, Mukesh sir, uh, are we good to go with the Q&A session? One second. Thank you. Can you folks hear me? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, Can hear you. Uh, I, yes. I was not able to unmute myself, so sorry, I couldn't answer. Right, right, right. Yes, can can hear you, sir, loud and clear. Yes. So let's hear the questions. I mean, I mean, in fact, I did end up a couple of minutes earlier than planned with the intention of you know, having a good times uh, available for a Q&A sessions. Right, right, absolutely right, sir. So we have got first question coming from Prijesh and he's asking, can you shed some light on faceless customs? So faceless customs is what the question is from Prijesh. Well, I mean, if you were to look at my last slide, it did talk about the initiatives taken by customs to ensure that uh, you don't have to be physically present to get your goods screened or evaluated. Okay, but however, see there are certain type of goods if they require to be physically examined, and some of them they can be passed off without physical examination. So which means that you will definitely have a face to face with the customs. So faceless would come in in cases where you have a known shipper concept. Okay. When you say a known shipper concept, this is something which happened after the 9-11, okay, where uh, security was taken uh, as a key factor for transportation of goods. In fact, there was even a talk that the cargo should not be uplifted on passenger aircrafts. But having said that, now what is happening is that customs give a permission to uplift a cargo after getting all the information about the shipper and the consignments. So when you have a known shipper concept, the customs is aware that this is a reliable customer. We need not physically check the cargo. We can give it the clearance to be cleared off or to be transshipped out. But then while the intention would be to get to a state where you will have faceless customs, but that will definitely not be a hundred percent possibility. Right, right. So the the possibility of having faceless customs uh, requires a lot of uh, stakeholders to be integrated with. So there is there is time still yet. Yeah. Right. No, besides besides stakeholders' uh, keenness to do it, okay, hmm. uh, some of them just need to be. Uh, screen just need to be physically uh, present. I mean, the, the, the people need to be there physically. Customers need to be there physically. You cannot do away with it. Right, right, right. The next question, uh, which one of our participants is asking, um, as to how Amazon Prime Airlines is are, are disrupting FedEx and UPS out there in the US market, and can it disrupt the same in the Indian market where we have a, got a growing middle class and can we see an Amazon Prime airline in, in India shortly doing cargo operations? Well, number one, Subhashi, I don't know why I'm not able to start my video. So probably I could have uh, spoken a little bit more on the video. Ah, uh, yes. Okay. All right. So people can actually see me when I'm... Right. I, I, I let me let me speak. Is there is something uh, which can be done to turn the video on, um, guys? I think I think I did see. Uh, yeah, start my video. Let me see. Can you see? No, not for now. Okay, never mind. So let me answer that question. Let me not spend time on that one. Okay. Right. So yeah. Amazon Prime coming to India? Yes, it will. Okay. Definitely it will. It's just a matter of time. Okay. Right. Uh, what is it they're doing different from FedEx and uh, from uh, UPS? Uh, the margin of difference will be very less, but with Amazon establishing itself as a uh, as a vendor, I would say, in the first place. You know, they're getting all the all these all the suppliers and the consumers on one platform. 
and they are the supplementing this with the service standard of okay of a next day delivery or a 24 hour delivery okay while ups and fedex also do the same thing but they don't have a control direct control over the end consumer but amazon has got the control over the end consumer as well so when you right. say that you want to order something from amazon you go to amazon you order something and now if amazon is going to move it on their own flight they are in complete control of the entire supply chain so they are integrators okay but they have that control over the shipper as well as the consumer or the consignee right that's, that's the difference between ups fedex and amazon prime right right so a very well said sir right over there so the next question is from karthik and he tries to or his his question is how is the uh, carrier hierarchy in cargo sector on an operational and the management front so he basically wants to know how the cargo basically moves from one hierarchy to the other hierarchy yes so when you talk about hierarchy you know i i didn't quite understand in, is it in terms of uh, the types of cargo so if you talk in types of cargo there are different types of cargo one is your general cargo then you have your special cargo then you have your express cargo okay a mail comes also under as as cargo then you right. have your courier okay so if you want to look at uh, the the uh, hierarchy is that's the thing that uh, the participant is asking then cargo moves towards the end Okay. Right. So when I say towards the end, it means that in a passenger aircraft, if you're transporting your cargo on a passenger aircraft, the passenger gets the first priority, followed by passengers' baggage, okay, followed by your mail, followed by courier, followed by special cargo, followed by general cargo. So that means in the event there is a necessity. to offload anything the cargo gets offloaded general cargo gets offloaded first right like i mean if you have vaccines on the flight you will not offload vaccines you offload general cargo okay now even at some cases if vaccine is on the flight and there is a need to offload something it don't have general cargo to be offloaded to be offloaded then they offload the passengers baggage and if passengers baggage cannot be uh, passenger says that no my bag is has to go then they offload the passenger as well right so it all depends on the type of cargo that is required now this is a very pertinent question especially when we are coming to the state where capacity is the constraint currently passenger aircraft are not operating so you have only cargo moving and cargo is moving on aircraft seats as well right right now when vaccines come into play as i said 8747 is required to move vaccine mm. currently there is a capacity crunch right now vaccines get a top priority if vaccines get a top priority where is the capacity for general cargo true 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 right And some of the general cargo as i said earlier as well 1% only is moving by air okay Now that one percent will become five percent, but that is all vaccines. That one percent of general cargo, which was earlier moving by air, will now have to move by ship. So if it moves by ship, the transit time is longer. True. So economy is going to get impacted because of that, unless a mechanism has been put to ensure that there's additional capacity available to move the cargo. I hope I've answered the question. If not. And yes yes right right it it meets the uh, sort of criteria of the question so right yes sir um well done so uh, before we sort of move on i would request everyone uh, there is an air worthy feedback form of this particular session in the chat box so kindly go out and fill that okay um so uh, sir uh, moving on to sort of the next question uh, which is asked by brijesh um will the cargo wave uh, reduce when the pandemic effect goes off so this growth in air cargo which you are seeing in this pandemic situation will that go off post pandemic well um it all depends on how you want to view the business okay? right number one is <clears throat> let's look at in terms of 
the volume. As I said, one percent is moving back there. So that means you have ninety nine percent moving by other means of transport. Right. What is it that is preventing this ninety nine percent to coming on to air? Okay. Definitely, there would be this cost factor involved. Okay. But right. then, if you take multimodal means of transport, that means you would probably use road, rail, ocean, air. Okay. So if you use all four. Cost of transportation comes down, which also means is that let's presume that you have to move and ship it from point A to point B, but you don't have any connectivity between point A and point B hmm. by by air. Okay, but if you adapt different modes of transport, then you were able to reach to point B. Okay, currently there is a option to point B. But the only option is C, which is taking much longer. But if True. you use multimodal, you are able to reach to point B within a shorter period of time than what it would take by C. So you got to think differently in terms of how do you want to engage your business. If you say that no air means it has to fly only on my airline, then you have it. If you say okay, right. fine, I can go on a different airline, but you're not talking multimodal. So you got mm. to think of different ways of doing business rather than having the same old structure of doing business. So in terms of capability or in terms of opportunity that is there, there's a tremendous opportunity to grow the business. But you need to change. You need to change the way you do your business. Absolutely right. So moving from traditional methods to modern methods will obviously accelerate the growth of air cargo in coming days. Yeah, multimodal right. is the way forward. I would say multimodal. And air airlines being one of them to kind of reduce that gap between uh, the time taken to move a consumer from point A to point B. Right, right, uh, perfect. So the next question is from a career perspective. Mm -hmm. So if someone wants to join the air cargo industry, I mean, what all courses he or she can do? And once entered into the air cargo industry, how the career progression is out there? I mean. Um, on a managerial position, how mm -hmm. you grow from one step to the other, and so on and so, right? Okay, one very important thing to make a good progress in the air cargo industry or the airline industry is to have a passion for the airlines. Right. So you should be passionate about the aviation industry. Passion will drive you to different positions. Okay. What programs you do? I would say you do any program. But unless right. you adapt your learnings to your day-to-day -day life, you will not progress. But if you want me to tell you which program to do well, recognized program is of course the IATA programs. Right. Okay. The end number of IATA programs which are there, those are recognized programs. Of course, there are other organizations providing you uh, programs. They are also as good as what is provided by IATA. I am not undermining any one of them. Right. But unless you adapt to your learning. And put them into practice. You cannot go ahead. True. Okay. Progression-wise, let me give you my example. I joined the industry in 1989 as a traffic assistant. A traffic assistant is a junior position in the airline. I started with Mirashi Kerala Air India. Okay. And I did all that it takes to understand the business, whether it was front office, back office. I was on the ramp in freezing temperature, loading and offloading cargo. I was on the ramp loading uh, the the parcels into the aircraft. Okay, I managed to handle or rather handle live animals, human remains, dangerous goods, you name it, all types of cargo. But the whole thing was, I learned how to deal with each type of cargo. So you need to have that uh, that passion for the industry, passion to learn, passion to understand more. Today also I'm learning. If somebody tells me something new, I will probably go and figure out how this could be incorporated into this business. So I moved from a traffic assistant to a customer services officer, to a sales manager, to a sales and operations manager, and then I moved to IT. And IT the progression was different. That's a different story. But from 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 where I was in the cargo industry itself, from a customer services manager, you could become the airport manager. You could become the station head, okay, or you could head the region as well. 
So unless you are passionate, you keep on learning. Uh, the 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 role that you get over a period of time is just you know uh, anybody's guess. Right, and I think passion, uh, which is I I believe personally as well, in my opinion, that passion is the one which drives you in any industry. I mean, if you have got the hunger to know more about that particular industry, you should always be passionate about it. Whether you are studying, whether you are at your workplace, you should always have the hunger to know more about how the industry works, how it performs. So, rightly mentioned by you, sir. Now, uh, moving on to the next question. um sir in your talk you mentioned about how um you know a covid vaccine if transported through uh, air cargo requires uh, you know so many you know thousands of 747s but if we uh, sort of take that opportunity and go ahead what sort of modifications the aircraft needs to have in order to sort of transport these vaccines in the rightful manner well first and foremost <clears throat> even as we speak today we don't really know what is the temperature required to move this vaccine right okay. take a simple case that you you get a vaccine from the manufacturer or we come in the cold storage vehicle to your premises to the airport and from the airport it moves from the terminal building to the aircraft okay if that moment itself is exposed to sun okay then the vaccine has starting to lose its immunity okay so see what the hyderabad airport has done they have introduced cool dollies right that means you are shipped will move from the terminal warehouse to the aircraft in a in the same state as it was received in the received uh, from the shipper or the manager right. or the uh, production unit now coming to what is required of a of an aircraft if the aircraft require a certain amount of Temperature to be maintained across the journey, then I think that is not a big issue because most of the aircrafts are able to meet that temperature requirement of two to eight degrees. Okay, the right. only problem that would be there is that, of course, there are few exceptions where some aircrafts do not have that capability, but that that can be easily modified. But the whole problem will not be on the capability of the aircraft. but the availability of the aircraft itself if you don't have a aircraft available then how would you move it right true yeah so so the whole thing is uh, again uh, economies of scale will also come in which would mean that suppose i move a shipment of vaccine from here to say nairobi hmm okay? and i move the 747 to nairobi i probably move 10777 to nairobi okay from nairobi i'm not getting anything back right because there is no exports from nairobi so those aircraft if they have to come back to say india as an example they are coming back empty so hmm. there is the economies of scale but however if a bottle has been adopted is there is there anything else that could be used to the nearest port to nairobi and from there uplift something else and move it back to india okay or move it to a third destination okay and the engagement between all the stakeholders like for example if i say that 10747 is available in nairobi if this information is available to somebody who wants to move something from nairobi to say london then he is aware of it right so it becomes very important to share data mm. so to answer the question capability is there with the airlines i am more worried about the last mile and the first mile hmm. those needs to be well met and of course the availability of capacity becomes the next important part from the airline perspective true true very well very well said sir right over there and uh, uh, sir moving on to the last question of the session although we have got plethora of questions available but i think we are running out of time um uh, the last question is what are your views on the recent cargo on seat um approach by airlines like spicejet and indigo uh, will there be any consequences in the long run of uh, you know transporting cargo on seats yes well in my opinion that's the best way to do business okay 
So right. adaptability is the key. So you have adapted to the current situation and said that hey, I can do this. But of course, you know there are a lot of things that need to come into play. Is the safety of the consignment on the sea? It right. needs to be properly secured. Okay. Number two, the upper deck cabins of the airlines are not equipped enough to handle emergencies. In case of a fire or in case of an you know, exigency, uh, I mean, when I say fire, of course, fire fighting capabilities are there because the crew is there on board. But if you're putting cargo on a seat, you don't have enough uh, crew. So those safety standards need to be adhered to. Okay. Number three is that loading of cargo on seat is going to be a cumbersome process unless we devise some other mechanism of loading the cargo and unloading of cargo. So the turnaround time of the aircraft is going to be a longer time. So there's right. going to be some impact, but going forward, I would recommend that a particular section of the aircraft should be made compatible to transport cargo as well as passengers, depending on the demand. That way, you would be able to manage the economies of scale. Like I just mentioned, if you have everything going from uh, from Bombay to Nairobi and nothing coming from Nairobi, okay, then you can at least you know do something about it in terms of uh, going to a different destination. Similarly, you could do that. You have no passengers coming in, you put cargo. Right, right. So, so it's all, uh, all about, of course, it requires structural changes to the aircraft, the safety features needs to be uh, re-looked re into, and figuring out what is the model that will work in such a way that if there is a demand for cargo, you uh, fill the seats or fill the aircraft with cargo in every possible place of the aircraft. And if you have more passengers, it's open for passengers and cargo will take a second, a second preference. So it's all about uh, my earlier statement which I said, a capacity gone based means that revenue is lost forever. So right. You have to find different ways of doing it. I appreciate whatever has been done currently by Spies, Indigo, British Airways, I think the many carriers who are doing this model, which is absolutely fantastic. Right, right. I think, um, you know, well, well said, sir, through all the answers. And there was more which we came to know through your, uh, you know, this Q&A session, it, it uh, sort of opened up a lot of practical aspects of the industry. Right. So before we sort of conclude the session, I will request everyone to sort of fill the feedback form, which is available in the chat box. So go ahead and fill that up. And also I request everyone now to sort of turn their cameras on so that we can have a final photo session of this uh, webinar please uh, i request everyone to turn their cameras on i'm sorry i'm not able to turn my camera i don't know for what reason uh, right sir i i am also not able to see you uh, yes um yes uh, so uh, a vote of thanks for obviously mukesh sir for your valuable time and your valuable insights into the world of air cargo and particularly um, you know the the digitization part of air cargo and how technology holds a key to success in the coming years for the air cargo industry i would also like to thank our partners at uran aviation academy uran institute of management studies uh, you know streamline aviation academy gmr aviation academy eagletronics aviation and freepasses.com without their support webinars like this are not possible and I request everyone to follow us on different social media platforms. So we are available on LinkedIn, Facebook, Instagram, and there is a lot of valuable content which is out there for you to view. Um, please, uh, if you have got any queries regarding this particular webinar, if you want to ask something else, kindly contact us on our WhatsApp number, and you can also drop us an email at info at Um, Thank you, Mike, sir, once again for your time. And thank you, Team Udan, for making this wonderful session and a very nice session on air cargo and obviously the, the digitization part of it. Thank you. Thank you all. Have a nice day. Stay safe. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.